Hi everyone, I'm Amy Kilmercher and I'm part of the online extension team for SENUSA. SENUSA is a research project investigating the creation of a Midwestern sustainable biofuel system. As part of this project, the online extension team is hosting this webinar series, Sustainable Production and Distribution of Bioenergy for the Central USA. Today's featured speaker is Dr. Stephen Wigulo. Dr. Wigulo is with the University of Nebraska-Lincoln Plant Pathology Department and with University of Nebraska-Lincoln Extension. He is also the pathology extension team member for the SENUSA project. Today, Dr. Wigulo will be presenting an overview of switchgrass diseases. And with that, I will let Dr. Wigulo have the floor. Uh, thank you, Amy. Um, good morning, uh, everyone. Um, as Amy said, uh, I am um, leading the extension component of the pathology for this project. And as you know, switchgrass is um, is is uh, a biofuels crop, um, and not much research has been done on diseases of switch switchgrass. So uh, this Sen USA project started um, just a couple of years ago, and we haven't yet uh, collected a lot of research data on switchgrass diseases. And so what I have done in this uh, uh, presentation is I did a literature review of what has been done uh, in other, uh, at other institutions and just put together an overview of uh, switchgrass diseases. So um, I will start uh, by just outlining what I'm going to talk about. Uh, first, I will um, have an introduction, which will be basically introducing you to plant pathology, more like uh, plant pathology 101. And then I'll talk about virus diseases of switchgrass, and then the fungal diseases. And under fungal diseases, I'll talk uh, about rust, uh, the leaf spots, smart, uh, root and lower stem uh, diseases, uh, bacterial and nematode diseases, and then I'll finish up with a, a conclusions uh, or summary um, slide. So uh, let's move on to the introduction. And for those of you who are not familiar with uh, plant pathology, uh, what do we mean when we say um, we are dealing with a plant disease? So I have a very basic definition of a plant disease here, and I have underlined the keywords. So uh, a plant disease is malfunctioning of host cells and tissues resulting from continuous irritation by a pathogen or environmental factor and leading to development of symptoms. So the keywords here are malfunctioning, and then uh, it has to result from continuous irritation. And that irritation is caused by a pathogen, uh, which is basically a disease-causing organism, or an environmental factor, uh, such as chemical injury or uh, adverse weather conditions. And then that irritation results in symptoms, which you can see uh, visually. So that's what a plant disease is. And in plant pathology, the concept of the disease triangle is used very widely. Uh, what it means is that there are three factors that must be present at the same time for disease to occur. And these are a favorable environment, a susceptible host, and a virulent pathogen. That's a pathogen that is capable of causing disease. So if you remove any of these factors, um, then uh, disease is not going to occur. So uh, when we talk of diseases of uh, switchgrass or any other crop, uh, those factors are very important in, in, in causing uh, disease and in uh, the development of disease in time and space. And so there are two major um, classes of, of of um, uh, you know classes of what causes disease. The first one is known as abiotic causes. So abiotic causes uh, they include non-living uh, uh, agents. For example, chemical injury uh, or uh, excessive heat 
or um, excessive fertilization. So those are abiotic, non-living causes of disease. So we are not going to deal with those in this presentation. Rather, we will focus on biotic causes of disease. And these are the living agents that cause disease. So we have four major uh, living co uh, agents that cause disease. Uh, viruses, uh, which you can see here in the, um, uh, on the uh, upper left uh, of the screen. And then bacteria, um, fungi, and nematodes. So of these four uh, biotic causes of disease, viruses are the smallest. In fact, they are so small, they cannot be seen with a, a, a regular compound microscope. Uh, they can only be seen with an electron microscope. And then bacteria are uh, bigger than they're the next larger group in terms of size. So this, this um, uh, slide shows the relative size. And then followed by the fungi and nematodes are the largest of, of, of the disease-causing organisms. So nematodes are, are actually um, worms, they're, they're microscopic worms, and uh, they can be seen pretty easily with just uh, a stereo microscope. So those are the biotic causes of disease, and we'll be looking at um, how these different uh, causes of disease affect switchgrass. And before we begin uh, with, with the biotic causes of disease, uh, I put in this slide to show you what the structure of a monocot plant is, which uh, switchgrass is a monocot. Uh, this happens to be um, actually a diagram of wheat, of a wheat plant, but it represents uh, very well the, um, uh, what a monocot, the structure of a monocot plant. So it has the roots and then the stem, uh, the leaves, and then the head. And then on the head, which sometimes is known as the panicle, um, the, we have kernels that develop uh, within, uh, on, on the head. And then uh, we have what we call the beard, which uh, actually is consists of ounce. So that is the, these are the parts of a, a monocot plant. And what I wanted to emphasize here is that diseases can affect any part of the plant, from the roots to the stem to the leaves to the head. So um, we are going to see some of these as, as we move on. Um, so let's then talk about um, virus diseases of switchgrass. There are four um, virus, uh, viruses that I found uh, in the literature to, 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 that have been reported on switchgrass. Uh, one is panicum mosaic virus, uh, then switchgrass mosaic virus, and barley or cereal yellow dwarf uh, viruses. This is a group of several different strains of viruses, uh, and then sugarcane mosaic. So these viruses have been um, uh, have been actually detected in switchgrass using molecular techniques and also uh, through observation of symptoms. So let's uh, start with the panicum mosaic virus. Uh, it's uh, a virus that, uh, and as you see, it's panicum. It was first observed on switchgrass, and switchgrass is panicum vagetum. That's the, uh, the botanical name of switchgrass. So panicum mosaic virus, which uh, uh, I am, I'm abbreviating here as PMV, uh, is, it was first observed in uh, 1953 on switchgrass, and this was in Kansas. And then in 1966, it was observed on St. Augustine grass in Texas. It's a single-stranded positive sense RNA virus, and RNA stands for ribo ribonucleic acid. Uh, so it's a, a positive sense, um, single-stranded positive sense RNA virus uh, belonging to the genus Panicovirus and family Tombasviridae. So uh, I'll, I'll use some of those technical terms from time to time. Uh, Panca mosaic virus supports the replication of a satellite virus, which is just a subunit of uh, a satellite uh, virus means it's a subunit of a, vi of, of a virus and it's not capable of replicating by itself. Uh, in order to do so, it has to be helped by the virus itself. 
which is known as a helper virus. So, so the satellite virus here is pan, satellite pancam mosaic virus, and the helper virus is pancam mosaic virus. So pancam mosaic virus um, helps the satellite virus to replicate. And so there is another satellite um, uh, set of particles known as satellite RNAs that will also replicate only if pancam mosaic virus is present. So, um, but pancam mosaic virus and satellite pancam mosaic virus are the major uh, focus uh, of this slide. So, uh, pancam mosaic virus is mechanically transmitted. Um, that means that uh, if it gets on um, farm implements, uh, if you use same, uh, uh, you, you cut the grass with an implement and the virus is there, it will get onto that implement you move to another field, you will transmit that virus. Or you touch the plant and get the virus onto your hands, you go and touch it, another plant, you will transmit the virus. So that's mechanical transmission. Uh, many other viruses are transmitted by insects. Uh, but pancom, for pancom mosaic virus, there is no known vector. Uh, it's transmitted mechanically. And then mixed infections of pancom mosaic virus and uh, satellite pancam mosaic virus have been reported in sweetgrass, sandbed grass, and St. Augustine grass. So both the virus and the satellite can, can infect the same plant. Okay, so this is a sweetgrass, these are sweetgrass plots. I took, actually I took this picture just uh, this last weekend on Sunday, and it shows a healthy uh, crop here. Um, and I'm going to show you the in the next slide, a switchgrass plant that is affected by pancam mosaic virus and uh, uh, and uh, satellite pancam mosaic virus. So this is what it looks like compared to the healthy uh, plants. And this picture was taken by Dr. Gary Yuen, who is the the pathologist working on the research aspect uh, on this on this project. So uh, you can see that there's very severe stunting uh, that these viruses can uh, the, the the virus and the satellite can cause, and so when you have a, a, a you know a huge field uh, with plants like this, and then you are talking of very drastic reduction in biomass production. So this is something that um, uh, you know this this virus and the satellite are something that need to be watched in switchgrass production uh, for biofuels. And here I would like to mention that a lot of the research that has been done on pancam mosaic and its satellite has been done in Texas, at, at Texas A&M. So uh, some, the literature I'm going to show is, is mostly from Texas. Um, so you can see that's the effect it, 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 it does, uh, severe stunting, and then basically the plant is very unthrifty and will produce very little biomass. Uh, a close-up of the symptoms, you can see the mosaic of green and light and yellow on the on the leaves. That's what, when you look at leaves, that those are typical symptoms of pancam mosaic virus and the satellite on, um, on, on switchgrass. Now, these are just symptoms that you see visually, but you cannot tell by just looking whether it's pancam mosaic virus by itself or together with the satellite or just the satellite by itself. So, uh, but usually the satellite will not occur by itself because it cannot replicate on its own. It has to occur together with the pancam mosaic virus. Okay, now this um, Dr. Skoltov at Texas NDM has done a lot of work on pancam mosaic virus, and she has shown that there is synergism between pancam mosaic virus and the satellite both infect a plant. And so this slide is showing um, pearl millet, and on the left panel are just pearl millet plants, and the right pa on the, on the right panel are the panicles. Now let's start with the left panel. Uh, this is a millet plant that is healthy; it was not in, in, uh, inoculated with the virus, and this is um, a, a, a plant that was inoculated with panica mosaic virus alone. And you can see just the virus alone has a significant effect on the size of the plant. And then now this one was infected by both pancam mosaic virus and satellite 
panka mosaic virus and you can see that it's the synergism is just drastic uh, so when both viruses occur together the effect is a lot um, more detrimental than if uh, either virus uh, or uh, either the virus or the satellite occurs alone and um, or uh, uh, or where well, the satellite cannot occur by itself because it has to replicate uh, with the help of the vi of the virus so um, so if the satellite is absent then um, then the effect is less detrimental if the, both the virus and the satellite are present then the effect is really detrimental to the to the plant so on the right uh, the right panel shows uh, just a similar thing but on the panicles and you can see that where there is the, the satellite and the virus are present, the panicles too are, are really of small size. So we think that this is occurring in nature and uh, we should be looking out for, for this in switch grass uh, production. So that's with uh, um, panica mosaic virus and its satellite. Now I will move on to the next virus, which is switch grass mosaic virus. And for the next, um, three viruses. I won't spend a lot of time because not much work has been done, but a lot of work has been done with Panca mosaic virus. So with switchgrass mosaic virus, uh, it was detected in 2010 uh, on switchgrass in Illinois. So this work that was done in Illinois, uh, it's closely related to uh, maize rayado fino virus. And this virus is transmitted by a leaf hopper. So, um, but the switchgrass mosaic virus has not really not much work. It was it has just detected in 2010 and uh, very little knowledge. We have very little knowledge about it. Um, so it they they have proposed uh, it it has been proposed as a new species uh, in the genus Marafivirus, uh, which is where the uh, the maize rhizophinovirus uh, belongs to, and then in the family Thymoviridae. Um, so this virus has also been detected in miscanthus, which is another biofuels crop, and uh, several other grasses. And uh, th these are the references for, 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 this, um, for this information. But you can see these are the symptoms that it causes in switchgrass. And then it causes um, slightly different symptoms in miscanthus. Um, so, uh, so here are some uh, of the, uh, the symptoms again. This is... Uh, Miscanthus by uh, Gigantias, and this is showing symptoms. This one is a healthy one, uh, and then this is um, another Miscanthus uh, species, and this is what it uh, it looks like on um, on uh, Panicum vegetum, which is switchgrass. Uh, you can see the red uh, the red dots, the brown brownish dots, and then this another uh, this Miscanthus sinensis. Again, it, it's showing different symptoms on the different types of species of miscanthus and, and, uh, and uh, switchgrass. Okay, so uh, the, next, uh, um, uh, the next set of viruses, these are actually a set of viruses uh, called Bali yellow dwarf, uh, also known as serial yellow dwarf viruses. They are just a, a, a set of them, there are more than 20 different strains that are classified into even within uh, different groups. And in Michigan, um, they have shown that switchgrass can accumulate uh, infection by bile yellow dwarf or a serial yellow dwarf uh, very quickly under natural conditions. They, they have, they have um, uh, used molecular tools to monitor these viruses in switchgrass. And then in, they have also done some greenhouse trials where they, um, they infected switchgrass in the greenhouse and they achieved up to that 8% infection rates in the greenhouse. So um, what they have observed is that in switchgrass, these viruses do not cause the typical symptoms that they cause in cereal, cultivated cereals. And I'll show you a slide of what the symptoms look like on wheat in the next slide. But on uh, switchgrass, they, they apparently, they, they, the, the the plants the leaves look fine but the viruses are are, are, are in the plant so this group also compared uh, cultivars and wild type populations and they found that cultivars appear to be more susceptible uh, to bile yellow dwarf than uh, the 
wild wild type populations. And so uh, the next slide shows uh, this uh, a wheat field with bali yellow dwarf. This this is what the symptom of bali yellow dwarf looks like on wheat. And uh, I would have expected it to look like th the same in switchgrass, but uh, apparently the switchgrass doesn't show symptoms even though the virus is, is present. But uh, on wheat, uh, what the virus does is it, the, the leaves start yellowing from the tip down, as you can see here, um, and then from the, the leaf margins towards the middle. Root. And in the field, you'll see lots of uh, yellow leaves, like uh, here is a cluster of, of yellow uh, leaves that um, are yellowing because of the uh, bali yellow uh, dwarf. So this just to demonstrate what it can do um, in terms of symptoms, but on switchgrass, apparently it doesn't cause um, prominent uh, symptoms. Okay, so and then another virus is sugarcane mosaic virus that it has been, um, uh, this virus has been only detected, but it, it, this was in Illinois again, and it was detected in asymptomatic switchgrass. So the switchgrass looked fine, but uh, they detected the virus in it, which means uh, this is another potential uh, uh, um, uh, virus to look out for in terms of uh, virus diseases of, of, of uh, um, switchgrass. Okay, so after those are the, the viruses that have been reported on switchgrass. Now, how do we manage them? So um, that's what the growers would like to know. So the management will depend on the specific virus and its etiology. That's how it interacts with the with, with switchgrass in terms of the biology. And this is not known for most of the viruses that I've mentioned. So we know a little bit more of on panica mosaic virus, but not the other viruses. Um, but resistance is the most effective management strategy for 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 viruses and any other uh, diseases of plants. And then for panica mosaic virus, um, which it's mechanically transmitted, therefore, if um, equipment is cleaned between fields or between sections of fields, then that will help to uh, reduce infections by panica mosaic virus. And uh, uh, switchgrass is, is, is propagated mainly through seed. And so we want to make sure that we are using seed that is clean uh, Sometimes it can be propagated vegetatively, and that's where it's more, much riskier to, 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 to carry it around. Um, it's not known whether it can be transmitted through seed or not. But if, it's, uh, if propagation is through uh, vegetative means, then we want to make sure that the stock is free of virus. And then uh, harvesting after the first frost can reduce spread. And the reason is that it's cold, and the virus would not be so active in those in those uh, un, uh, cold cold conditions. So those are pro just management strategies that um, we think can work. But we have a lot to do in terms of the research in order to determine how um, effectively these management strategies can work on switchgrass. Uh, on um, cultivated cereals, we a lot has been done, and we know exactly what to do to effectively manage. But on switchgrass, uh, we still need more research to to to, to determine um, how effective these strategies can be and how we can improve them. Okay, so I will now switch gears and um, uh, talk about rust. Um, rust is one of the major diseases uh, on 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 um, uh, on switchgrass, and uh, rust diseases on grasses usually have complicated life cycles, often requiring two hosts and several spore types to complete the life cycle. So uh, you know, on the next slide, I'll show you the life cycle of wheat stem rust, which is just uh, um, as, as a, a model uh, system for, for the life cycle, complicated life cycle of rust. Uh, the rust is most often initiated by uridospores, also known as uridinospores, these are the repeating spores, and they're the most important type of spore that uh, causing uh, epidemics of, of rust in, in um, cereals and grasses. So the repeating spore, uridiospores, are produced on the primary host, in this case, switchgrass. 
then there's another type of spore known as an issue spore which is produced on the alternate host uh, in which in this usually the alternate host is a dicot and the primary host is a grass so uh, here is a, 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 a complicated life cycle of rust uh, on, on the cereals. This happens to be wheat. But I just wanted to point out the types of spores. So if we start here, this is the dicot, this is the alternate host. Um, uh, there's a, a, a spore known as Pasidio spores. From the alternate host, they, uh, these Pasidio spores, they undergo in the alternate host a series of develop, developmental stages and eventually they produce another spore known as the issue spore. This issue spore infects the primary host. In this diagram, it's wheat, but you know, in, in, on our topic, it would be switchgrass. And then again, it undergoes a series of developmental stages within the primary host. And within seven to ten days after the initial infection, uridial spores, which are the repeating spore, they they form uh, in in millions. These spores are picked up by wind and the wind spreads them to healthy plants. So actually a, a, a large field can be um, can have rust just within a period of a week to two weeks because of the spread of these spores by wind. So the irritable spores at the end of the growing season, they, um, they turn into another type of spore known as a teleospore. Then this teleospore germinates to form basidiospores, which then infect the alternate host. So um, for uh, for the wheat stem rust, the alternate host is barberry, but for um, for switchgrass, it's thought to be spudge. So let's look at the next slide. Um, uh, this slide just shows the um, what we call the Paxinia pathway. Uh, the rust usually over winter in southern states because it's warmer there during the winter, and um, we have green vegetation uh, even during the winter. So they overwinter there, and then uh, during the growing season in the spring, they are blown up uh, by wind. Uh, but most of the, uh, the, the the rusts caused by this species, Paxinia, they follow this path um, from the southern states to the northern states, known as the Paxinia uh, pathway. So in cereals, um, the, the, the primary inoculum or the primary spore that causes rust is the repeating spore, which is the uridospore. In switchgrass, we don't know because um, work on switchgrass just started recently, and I have a couple of studies that I will show you. Um, so we don't know that it's the I think it's the uridal spores that are also the primary um, uh, inoculum for switchgrass, but this is not known. Uh, but based on on what I know on on cereal uh, rust, uh, that's what I think. Uh, but it, it, it's not known. So switchgrass rust is caused by Paxinia emaculata. Uh, that is the, the, the most common uh, cause or agent of switchgrass rust. But there are a couple of other um, uh, rust fungi that can cause uh, rust on switchgrass. One is Paxinia graminis, and another one is Euromyces graminicola. So, but the one that has been seen to cause most of the rust uh, diseases on on or, um, on on uh, switchgrass is Paxinia immaculata. The alternate host is is thought to be spudge, and it's not known whether the inoculum is the primary inoculum. So you, you, that's the inoculum that initially starts the initial uh, disease cycle. Whether it's uridospores, spores, the repeating spores, or whether it's issue spores, the ones that are produced on the alternate host. Um, so. Switchgrass rust has been reported in many states in the southeast uh, and in the midwestern um, United States. So uh, I will now show you some of the research that has been done. This is a, a study that was done in um, in uh, Oklahoma uh, just over this last several uh, years in the late 20, uh, 20s. Um, and these are pictures showing uh, a susceptible variety and uh, a picture showing a resistant variety to, to switchgrass rust. Um, then, so this 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 must have been a graduate student uh, that did this. He inoculated uh, in the greenhouse, and you can see even uh, within in the lab inoculations in the lab result in a, a you know the, the pastures of rust uh, forming. And so this orange 
brown um, uh, pastures, those are the ones that are pro that produce the repeating spore that is the most important. That's the one that cycles every seven to, to 10 days and is spread by wind uh, to infect healthy plants. Uh, th this is what the spores look like um, under a scanning electron microscope and then under light microscope uh, for the rust fungus. And there is a rating system. How, how do you assess disease if you are doing research on rust? So there is a rating system that is similar to what they use for stripe rust of wheat. And it, um, that rating system is explained in more detail in this publication here, but it's on a scale of zero where they, there's no, no disease at all to a scale of nine where there is uh, the maximum amount of disease. But this publication gives the details of how to, to use this rating scale. But that's the one we use for switchgrass. Uh, it's very similar to the one used for stripe rust of wheat. Okay, so this student in Oklahoma, he had two variety, four varieties that he worked with, uh, two um, uh, uh, lowland var varieties, Alamant Canlo, and then uh, two upland varieties, uh, Kevin Rock and Summer. And he did, a, he assessed rust severity and found that uh, the lowland cultivars actually had less disease, they were more resistant than the upland cultivars. And this summarized in, the, in, in, in this uh, graph on the right side of the slide, you can see the lowland uh, uh, cultivars had less disease than the upland cultivars. So it seems there is some resistant, uh, resistance in the lowland um, uh, switchgrass cultivars that can be used uh, by breeders to breed for resistance in new cultivars of switchgrass uh, for resistance to rust. Um, so uh, another student, this one in Tennessee, uh, he did um, some epidemiology studies where he, he monitored rust when it appeared and how it progressed during the growing season. And so uh, he found that in Tennessee, uh, switchgrass rust first appeared in early June um, when plants were at the five to seven leaf uh, growth stage. And then disease severity progressed in a logistic pattern. And I will show you in the next graph what a logistic pattern means. And uh, disease developed most rapidly between mid-June and mid-August, and it slowed down in late August to early September. Uh, I expect a very similar uh, pattern here in the Midwest, uh, except that it may be a, a little later because, uh, just because we are further north. Uh, and then what the student noticed that was that the lower leaves usually died uh, from these rust infections. So this is, these are the graphs. This is what we call the logistic pattern. Uh, disease starts to increase, but at a slow rate at first. Then uh, in the logistic phase, it increases rapidly and then slows down again. And so he's, he had four locations, and you can see that the rust uh, followed the same pattern in all locations, except that some locations, these two locations had less disease than these other locations. So um, again, uh, the, depending on where the field is located, you may have a higher uh, severity of disease um, uh, or a lower severity of disease. But, but this is encouraging because at least some folks are, are doing research that we can now use to, um, to, to, to develop management recommendations for switchgrass rust. Okay, so how do we manage uh, uh, switchgrass rust? Uh, again, resistant uh, cultivars, that's the most effective uh, means. And as we screen cultivars for resistance and identify resistant ones, uh, breeders can use those resistant ones in their breeding programs to develop rust resistant um, uh, cultivars of switchgrass. Then fungicide application, you can apply a fungicide to control rust. Um, on the, some of the labels of fungicides for cereals, they actually have grasses uh, in there. And you have to make sure that you are following the label before you apply a fungicide. The few labels I looked at uh, said that you can apply a fungicide to grasses that are grown for seed production. Um, so I don't know that uh, for, for bioenergy, I think we can still do the same. Uh, but you want to make sure that you are following the label and following the law uh, when, when you apply these fungicides.
Okay, I will switch gears now and talk about um, uh, leaf spot diseases. Um, these are some of the some pictures taken by Dr. Gary Yuen uh, at at Mead, uh, uh, which is a, U, uh, a University of Nebraska research farm. And um, so the leaf spots they are caused by fungi. They look like this. Um, I'll go to the next slide just to run through. This here is another one that looks a little different uh, from the previous one. And then, um, and then here is a close-up of of a more um, a severely affected uh, plant here with leaf spot fungi. So, uh, Dr. Yuen, uh, here is a, a close-up of another leaf spot. These are all taken at Mead um, here in Nebraska. And uh, so. Uh, Dr. Yuen tried to isolate fungi from these leaf spots, and what he found is he isolated alternaria, and he isolated bipolaris. And bipolaris is known to cause spot blotch in switchgrass. Um, there is a, a species of bipolaris that that cause that is known to cause spot blotch in in switchgrass. And then he has also a, a isolated former. So these are the three fungi that have been isolated from leaf spots. On switchgrass here in Nebraska. Uh, however, he has not done what we call Cox postulates um, to, to to determine that they are. So Cox postulates just means you isolate the fungus, then inoculate to healthy plants and see if you can reproduce uh, the same symptoms that you initially saw. Um, so we have not done these, but these are the fungi that we have uh, isolated from um, uh, from mead here in Nebraska. Uh, on switchgrass. So and then other folks in other institutions um, have done uh, uh, have done some inoculations. Um, in uh, at Kansas State, this 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 work that was done at Kansas State, they inoculated switchgrass with um, a, a, a fungus that causes a, a disease of wheat known as tan spot. So this fungus is known as Pyrenophora trichy repentis. They inoculated it on switchgrass and successfully uh, um, uh, uh, caused it uh, disease on switchgrass. But the disease severity was uh, very low compared uh, to a susceptible wheat, wheat cultivar. On the switchgrass, it was like 13% severity. And on the susceptible wheat cultivar, it was like 60% severity. So it, it can infect. So that shows that it's a potential for this fungus uh, to infect wheat. Uh, but uh, it has not been uh, seen in nature, but but apparently it can infect. So this is what the fungus looks like on wheat. This is transport of wheat, and this, you know, it has been reproduced on switchgrass. So there's a potential that the transport fungus can go on switchgrass. And what I have seen, like I, you know, I've seen uh, wheat fields next to switchgrass fields and so forth. So so this is something. This is um, uh, some new information that that. Uh, uh, they found out at, at Kansas State. So and then at um, Rutgers University, um, they identified another leaf spot uh, pathogen known as Colletetricum navitas. Uh, they identified to be the cause of anthracnose. And anthracnose has been known since the 1880s, uh, but the cause of agent had never been experimentally determined or taxonomically classified. And so um, these folks at Radcast University, they did some very uh, detailed and systematic studies and used molecular tools to identify the causal agent of anthracnose of switchgrass as Colletetricum navitas. Um, here are some of the symptoms of the fungus. Uh, this has, it causes leaf spots. Uh, these dark uh, spots are fruiting structures. Here, here are what the lesions look like on, on the stem. And then on the leaves, and uh, here are some um, uh, close-ups of, of, of uh, structures of the fungus. These are known as CT. Uh, here, here's a, a close-up of it. So um, anthracnose has been. Uh, this is just a couple of years ago, a few years ago, that they identified uh, the fungus uh, as an, uh, and and the disease as an anthracnose. The spores of the anthracnose pathogen on switchgrass look. They look like this. Uh, I won't spend time on that. Um, so how do we manage leaf spot diseases? And again, like for rust, 
uh, resistant cultivars, uh, that would be the most effective management strategy. But again, the leaf spots are caused by fungi, so we can apply fungicides to control these diseases. Um, but again, uh, you have to read the label and know, um, make sure that you're following the label instructions and restrictions. Okay, so uh, the last group of diseases or, or the last disease I'll talk about, uh, because the rest of them are, are actually have not been seen, but I put them in there uh, in, into the presentation just so you know that there's a potential that they can be there, uh, is smart of switchgrass. This disease apparently is very um, uh, prevalent in the Midwest and it can cause some very significant uh, losses in switchgrass. So uh, they, it's caused by a fungus known as Tilesia maclagani. Uh, it has been reported in Connecticut, Iowa, Illinois, Kansas, Nebraska, and New York. And in the late 1990s, there were outbreaks in Iowa. And in the late 2000s, there were outbreaks of smart on switchgrass in New York and Pennsylvania. Uh, it's seed transmitted and can cause very severe stunting of, of switchgrass. Uh, the smarted panicles emerge earlier than normal panicles, about three to four weeks earlier than normal panicles. And they have a compact club-shaped appearance and enlarged florets uh, with swollen ovaries. Um, and within those ovaries, the, uh, instead of seeds, you have uh, just a, a mass of, of orange, um, uh, rusty orange spores. And I'll now show you some pictures. Again, this is from a publication by uh, from Iowa State University. Uh, so uh, in 2002, uh, they did a survey uh, and found that disease incidents in naturally infested Iowa fields of SMART ranged from uh, just under 1% to about 55%. And the overall disease incidents, disease incidents just means the number of the percentage of plants infected. Um, uh, it was 26%, which is pretty high. And then yield loss in individual fields ranged from 1.7 to uh, 40%. Um, and then overall yield loss in all fields was about 17%, and that's pretty huge also. Uh, and then they've also found that yield loss was strongly and linearly related to disease incidence. So I'll show you, uh, this is the graph of yield on the y-axis. Uh, or yield loss on the y-axis and the incidence of SMART on the x-axis. And you can see there's a very strong linear relationship between yield loss and SMART incidence. The higher the incidence, the higher the yield loss. Um, and then now I'll just show you some pictures of the SMART on switchgrass. This is from uh, New York and Pennsylvania uh, when it was first reported. Uh, here uh, is a healthy panicle and here is a smarted panicle, and then um, here is a healthy floret, and here is a smarted floret, and this is what the spores look like. They are uh, just rust and orange. And then some more pictures. Uh, this is from Iowa, from the publication in, uh, that was done in Iowa. Uh, and again, this is a smarted panicle just after flowering and um, several weeks, uh, uh, several weeks uh, after flowering. Um, and then here is a picture showing a very standard plant that is affected by SMART uh, right beside one that is, um, is healthy. And you can see the health one, this is as tall, uh, as, uh, how, how tall it is, and then this is where the smarted one is. So a lot of um, uh, reduction in, in growth by this fungus. And then here are some bundles. They, took from the different, uh, from the fields in the, their survey. These are smart, from smarted plants, uh, and this is from healthy. So you can see the, the yield reduction is tremendous uh, uh, for this disease. So um, how do we manage uh, uh, switchgrass smart? Uh, we don't know much about the etiology or how it interacts with, with, with its host and the epidemiology. So, uh, more research is needed in order to develop uh, effective management strategies. However, potential management strategy, strategies include uh, use of resistant cultivars, uh, use of clean seed. It's a it's a, a seed transmitted fungus. 
uh, it infects when the seed germinates and then it grows within the plant you don't know that it's there until later on when you start seeing the uh, stunting and then eventually when the panicles emerge you see uh, the, 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 the fungus on the panicles and then uh, we can use fungicide seed treatments um, uh, I would imagine that the, the fungicide seed treatments that we use in cereal crops like wheat can be used uh, uh, here as well and then prescribed burning is, is a suggested management strategy where if you do prescribed burning after the burning you basically kill a lot of the, 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 the spores uh, of the smart fungus so root and lower stem diseases of switchgrass not much is known about them um, but that does not mean they are not there it just means that it, um, work has not been done on switchgrass because it used not to be an economically important crop but now that it's becoming an economically important crop hopefully some more work will be done to to see if there are root and uh, uh, lower stem diseases however there's a disease known as sharp eye spot which affects uh, the lower stem bases of wheat uh, this disease is caused by rhizoctonia it has been reported on switchgrass in the UK so there's potential I mean it's possible that it could be here as well and then this is what uh, sharp eye spot looks like on wheat and so if it, uh, it occurred on switchgrass um, it would basically that those um, it causes these types of spots and then uh, the stem bases basically get discolored and rotted uh, but if it occurred on switchgrass I would imagine that the symptoms would be similar but this is what it looks like on wheat um, then bacterial and nematode diseases um, I did not find any of these in the literature so um, and again it doesn't mean that they don't occur it just means that not much work has been done to uh, to to detect these diseases but hopefully um, you know uh, uh, in future we will be able to to, to um, detect some of these diseases uh, so but so research research is needed to, to do this um, and I'm sure with time we'll, we'll, we'll get there so to conclude um, the following diseases have been reported on switchgrass in the United States uh, virus diseases and I named uh, some of them panca mosaic virus switchgrass mosaic sugarcane mosaic um, and the Bali yellow dwarf or cereal uh, uh, yellow dwarf uh, viruses and then leaf spots uh, fungal leaf spots including anthracnose and spot blotch and smart so these are the diseases that have been reported on switchgrass in the United States and not much is research has been done on them so we need research in order to elucidate the etiology and epidemiology of these diseases and that will enable us to devise uh, effective uh, management strategies with that i will conclude my presentation and uh, entertain any questions